Hello again, class. Um, this video that we're doing here is actually about some of the material you're going to be reading and looking at this week. Um, this week and most of next week and a little bit into the third week, we're looking mainly at how history becomes legend and I guess becomes literature, stories. Um, this week we're primarily concerned with history. You've got a map, you've got a timeline, you have a historical introduction. I'm not going to get into the itty bitty nitty gritty. Uh, bitty detail, details, sorry, of each of those things, um, though I do ask some detailed questions. However, there's no reason why you can't have two tabs open on your online web browser and have the materials open in one tab and your quiz open in another tab so that you can find those details. That's one of the nice things about online class. I mean, I have no real, real way of controlling whether or not you're using your notes or you're reading materials uh, while you're taking your quiz, and that's just fine. That means you have to do some detailed searching uh, back through your reading, um, and, and that's a good thing. So, the um, basically what your historical introduction is from the Mammoth Book of King Arthur. It's a really neat little book, well, big book, I guess, uh, and I definitely recommend it to you all if you want uh, some discussion of some of the issues surrounding the Arthurian legend. It's, it's really good. We're only going to read pieces of it in this class, um, but you're certainly welcome. It's, it's available on Kindle, um, Amazon, so you can get it as an ebook um, and, and read it as you want and as we go along. But the what it talks about is, uh, at least this week that we're talking about, is the historical person of Arthur and who is Arthur and, you know, what is this problem that we have with this figure of Arthur and uh, one of the things it talks about for instance okay what does Arthur's name mean well it's a reference to the word there um, you know when do we think Arthur existed well uh, your your introduction is going to say around the fifth century um, which is somewhere late 400s early 500s uh, CE or AD whichever date system you prefer and um, Anyway, you have to remember that uh, Roman Britain, basically the Romans left Britain at, in 410. Uh, and when they leave, for, for a little while, a decade or two, things kind of continue on until um, their last rulers die off. Um, one of the most important things to know is that Gildas, who's the only real contemporary writer that we have, who um, may have referred to Arthur, refers to a person called Ambrosius Oriolanus. And um, our author in the Mammoth Book of King Arthur doesn't talk as much about him as a potential, potential Arthur, but more historical records um, and historical scholarship talks about him as a potential Arthur. But there are a lot of potential Arthurs, some actually named Arthur and some not. Of course, we have uh, the big thing uh, kind of issue that um, our author takes under consideration is that he's going to talk about the Arthur of Baden Hill, that this uh, battle of Baden Hill, this really important battle, is uh, what kind of defines who we think of as Arthur the real historical Arthur, whoever that Arthur is, and he offers several candidates. Um, and as we finish this historical piece, we'll look at what he has 20 different possible candidates that might have been the historical Arthur, and he discovered, he discusses the positives and negatives uh, for each candidate. And so we are definitely dealing with some of the history part of it now. And so you're like, well, I'm in a literature class, why am I reading the history? But again, we want to talk about how the history becomes literature. And, um, and like I said, you're going to know a whole lot more about Arthur and the problem of Arthur when you leave this class. Really know about Arthurian literature. So, so these are some of the things. The other thing you need to know is, um, you know, Romans come in and take over Britain. You have your revolts in, in the early 3rd century and all this sort of thing. But they're really quite settled through most of the 4th century or the 300s um, CE AD. They're, they're pretty settled, but as things kind of heat up on the continent, they need to start withdrawing their forces, and they do slowly over time, to take it back to Rome because they're having issues at Rome. And, of course, Rome itself falls. And when Rome itself falls, then, you know, certainly they're not, their minds are not on some colony that's, that's quite, a far, quite far away. The reason why they want Britain in the first place, though, is because Britain has a lot of tin, and tin is used to make bronze. And that's necessary for weapons, and so that's why Britain is valuable to them in the sense of conquest earlier on, before before the fall, fall of Rome. And um, 
And then as, as they leave, you kind of get kind of a, a sense of turmoil. In fact, I was watching a, a special this week um, on blood diamonds in the 90s, 80s and 90s, and you have the issue in Sierra Leone. Well, Sierra Leone was a colony of Britain back, you know, until like 1955 or so, and then they handed it over. Well, Britain, col colonizers, imperialist-type countries, do build infrastructures in those countries that they colonize, and that can be seen as a positive or negative thing. But when they leave, that infrastructure doesn't have the same support um, because it doesn't have the official support of the colonizing country. And so, basically, the, the country now on its own has to develop infrastructure, and some countries do this better than other countries in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone did not do it very well at all. Of course, they had the additional struggle of having such valuable welfare in in the diamonds that they have there in the eastern part of the country. So you have kind of maybe a similar issue with Britain. When, when the Romans leave, they leave some infrastructure in the sense of roads and buildings and baths and that sort of thing. But... Um, a lot of the way that things are set up and, and the way they rule and divide places up and stuff is now it's gone. And so we have kind of this, this more chaotic atmosphere. Roads that are good to travel on, um, but then over time are not kept up and so obviously fall fall down. I mean, roads that we drive on today, 10 years, that's their lifespan. We don't think of that all the time. We're constantly seeing road construction everywhere. Um, and, um, you know, it, it was the same then. They... They built a good road, the Romans did. Uh, There's still traces of Roman roads all over Europe. But, nonetheless, they would have decayed. You would have gotten grass coming up, all this kind of thing. And um, so these sorts of infrastructures would break down. And then you get more of kind of these clan and small geographic region sort of ways of uh, conceiving of things because that is reasonably how much land you can control. You know, we they got horses in England at the time, in Britain. But there's not a whole lot of them, and they tend to be smaller. So, so your, um, your transportation is possible, but slower, a little more controlled uh, by your means of transportation. And so this, you know, this is, is kind of what's going on. This is what people often call the Dark Ages. And then, of course, you also have the, um, the invasions that are going on with the Vikings later on and... Um, I don't know if I necessarily completely agree with the term Dark Ages, but it's just not, you know, it's not the classical time where there was lots of learning and lots of infrastructure. Um, so you you do have more of these local, small local areas. And, you know, even when we talk about Arthur potentially as a real person and being a warlord, uh, we talk about a person who's actually going to rule a fairly small area. The legends talk about him being the first king of England, like in all the British Isles. And actually, the, the, the grander later legends talk about him being like the whole king of like Europe and the old Roman Empire. Um, but it, as a historical person, we're talking about a person who potentially ruled a small area, uh, more like the size of a British county. Uh, which would be comparable to, to our counties today. And counties today are usually 30 by 30. The reason why they're 30 by 30 is you can travel to the center, the county seat, in a day's riding. That's 30 miles. And so in any, you can reach any point of the county within a day. So if we're going to say that potentially this is the, the size of area we're looking at or smaller, it's not going to be huge. I mean, it has to be a, a sizable a, enough area that we can control easily with um, with fewer men and uh, less support, just just the people we've grown up with and our, our kind of our clan type so uh, uh, city or town. And um, so this is you know kind of the, the sort of society that we've got going on. And, and then of course we see the um, if you look at the map, you see that Loger is called, Logris, I never know how to say that quite right, is kind of like the Welsh word for England. Um, and that's where Arthur's supposed to be king. But more often than not, we talk, uh, historians talk about Arthur coming from the area of Cornwall, which is that southern part of England. Of course, we say that England often looks like a rabbit. Well, you know, at the top, the ears, they, that's Scotland. Um, but the bottom part, that's Cornwall. And if there was a Camelot, yeah. Um, it would have been in that area, that sort of thing. And you see those potential areas 
plotted out on the, on the map that I've provided. Another thing I've provided, uh, I've provided a timeline that traces not just potential Arthurs and, and key historical events, but it also traces the development of the legend and major works that are published about Arthur uh, all the way through today. Um, and then I also have some commentary from people also all the way to today, starting with figures like Gildas. And, you know, Gildas, again, he writes about Ambrosius or Aelanus and, and how he wins a number of battles. And we think Ambrosius or Aelanus was probably some kind of half-Roman, half-British-Celtic uh, warlord, um, maybe the grandson of a Roman general or something captain that's in, was in the area but left and went when the Romans left but he left some of his bloodline there and so they had kind of that maybe was brought up with some of the Roman military discipline or something like that made helped him be a leader in his way after the Romans left so this is the sort of person there's a really good book uh, called Age of Tyrants that talks about uh, this Ambrosius Oriolanus as a potential leader and what type of person he might have been considering societal circumstances. Anyway, so these, these are kind of the issues that we're running up against. Of course, Gildas, Gildas isn't talking about, he's not concerned with Ambrosius Oriolanus really as a, as a figure. He, he's preaching. He has religious ideas and concerns in his writings. And of course, we're going to read Gildas next week. Uh, not this week, next week. You'll just read a small part of him this week in the commentary. But we're going, so you're going to see what his real concern is and how much we can take him as a historical source. According to our historical introduction, uh, Gildas is writing at least 100 years after, which we can't blame too much as being uh, unreliable because many people accept, if they're Christian, accept the Gospels, and the Gospels are written almost a hundred years after the death of Christ. So, and at the very least, 30 years after the death of Christ. And so there's still a number of years, and considering especially people's lifespans at the time, um, we have to accept when we look at historical documents that there's going to be some span of time, usually between the event and uh, when someone really chronicles it, or, or that the chronicle that we have of it often is from later. Not that there wasn't a chronicle of it, but just that it's been lost because those materials deteriorate. And, you know, we, it's just kind of luck of the draw what makes it down to us. And so we have to always keep that, keep that in mind when we're dealing with any kind of historical record. The other thing we have to take into mind is, um, and this really plays into the whole literature question, is the way people at the time thought about history. History to them was not literally a series of dates. Uh, not that they didn't write chronicles and they didn't talk about dates and, and names and that sort of thing. They did. But it wasn't so much about, can I go to this place and dig up some kind of archaeological artifact and absolutely, like with the scientific method, prove that this happened, which is, is um, an obsession with today's culture. At the time, not so much of an obsession. Um, it was more about, as you'll see with Gildas, who were these people what did they do? What can they teach us? And whether it happened within a 60-year span or if we can give it an exact date is not as important as what they can teach us. Like, literally, his story. History. This is the story of the person um, that we're telling, and usually, usually male, because of the, you know, the obvious prejudices at the time. And um, so, so think of it that way, that this really is more about history as a story and how that story develops into this legend, this mythic, uh, just out of control sort of myth, almost like, you know, the, the stories of the Greek gods and goddesses and all, all those sorts of things. They had to have begun probably with the small kernels of truth and they become this incredibly involved soap opera of myth. Um, but they were ways of explaining things. Okay, so myth for ancient cultures is a way of explaining thing, things, and it continues on into this period, and even more than becoming a way of explaining things, it, because of Christianity, it becomes a way of teaching things. Um, and so just keep all of these things in mind. There's a lot to, to take in for this first week. Um, again, most of these video lectures were going to be kind of like this. I want you to see the, the big picture of of what we're learning for the week and pull out kind of a few little uh, nuggets 
And um, so if you have any questions, again, just uh, shoot me an email and some of the questions will be over some of the more general information in, he in this video. Some of the questions will be specific um, over some of the reading, though usually I just ask two or three of those really specific questions where you've got to search through your reading and find what you need. Uh, but if you did the reading, usually you can flip to where you need to be. Again, uh, scroll down <laughs> to where you need to be. And again, there's no problem with you having a couple of tabs open while you're taking your quiz. Quiz open one tab, reading open another tab. Um, you have an hour and a half to take your quiz. So um, 10 questions, hour and a half. Um, and I wish you good luck.